what you accomplished and celebrate that with muffins and coffee. Um, so without any further ado, we have um, our motivational interviewing training. This is going to give a brief overview because I know that um, since last meeting we had a few people reach out and say that this is something that they were interested in. So I contacted Bob Joe and he's a, a experienced motivational interviewer. He is from New Bedford. He teaches at Salve Regina University and also works for the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health. So he is an expert in this field. So we'll get a nice overview today. And if you guys are interested, maybe we'll be able to have him back again to do some more in-depth training with us. So if you'd like to take it. Just to get started, I'd like to kind of get a sense of, uh, first of all, kind of what folks in the room know about motivational interviewing as a conversational model already, and uh, and within that, kind of what the thoughts were around uh, what it might, what help it might be to what you do. Uh, any anyone willing to kind of put themselves out there on that? I studied it, you know, in grad school, and I actually recently went to a training where they were talking about uh, duly diagnosed parents and you know trying to treat the whole person instead of, you know, compartmentalizing, you know, different issues that people have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were really, um, really, you know, pushing the whole idea of motivational interviewing and sort of the, uh, uh, how the words are escaping me, but, you know, the thought process where the pre-contemplation pre yeah. and then contemplation and then planning and whatever action. Uh, maintenance and, and then, you know, um, recidivism or whatever. So um, I think when you're working with kids at school, it's, it's very difficult for us because we're always so pressured to, to move them towards the goal. Yeah. And motivational interviewing is really about meeting them where they are mm -hmm. and supporting that, supporting them at that point. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a stress from our perspective as school adjustment counselors in terms of, you know, being pressured to move kids along, yeah. maybe beyond where they are at the moment. So it's kind of a way of helping them to take more of that responsibility on themselves and taking some of the pressure off of the staff person, but also uh, a way of kind of seeing where a person's at in yeah. the change process yeah. and being able to kind of target what they say to that place right. uh, in a way to try to be as effective as possible. And I, I think that, you know, the new initiative that we're starting now with collaborative problem solving kind of fits in well with this need to be more guided by where the child is. So I think that certainly is in this direction, would you say? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Other uh, thoughts or anything? Yes. Yeah, just to, to add to what she said, uh, I was trained in motivational enhancement therapy, which is a very, like, similar principles yeah. and um, I really like the fact that it's it's very client driven so again it's not like this is what I think you should do because it's going to be good for you but it's getting them through that through the process so that they're they're ready for that change and like she kind of mentioned the, 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 the change, change of change model so it's like it's not again it's not that force of somebody telling me what to do and, and there's a lot of that resistance and tension but it's more of it being an organic desire and like I see the need to, to make this change and I'm going to work towards getting there and it's, it's a, a very different approach from I think a the lot person, of traditional client work. Yeah, the person choosing that for themselves and wanting that for themselves for their own reasons as opposed to us telling them. Exactly. Sure. So, anything else? I think just we, I had a week training on it um, through like a managing essentials program where we had a brief training on specifically how to motivate our interviewees when we're actually interviewing for employment mm -hmm. and talking about schema recalls. So as far as like letting someone be able, because people are nervous during the interviews when they go, so just giving them an actual schema so that they can recall. So for instance, um, interviewing someone in a way where um, instead of um, tell me about your strengths and weaknesses, as opposed to giving them, so opposed to that, giving them a schema such as tell me about a time when you had an instance at work where you had to interview between two employees that are having difficulty. So it actually gives them the opportunity to go back and see that and replay that and be able to relate that through their, their um, interview process. More real for the person. Yeah. As opposed to that more abstract sort of uh, nerve-inducing question. <laughs> I was always convinced 
that, that we use those questions because they make people nervous. Indulging little stages in the theater process, but maybe maybe I was off on that. Uh, any other uh, thoughts or comments? Yes. Um, I think it could be a really helpful approach, especially with those mandated clients. Yeah. Just have a nicer communication style and approach with them. Really, just seeking out for them. So you work with some folks that, that are kind of stuck with having the talk to you, and then, or at least... Yeah, maybe, yeah. We're, you know, they're made in by DPS. Yeah. Uh, and this is an easier way, certainly, to engage that population mm -hmm. or folks in that sort of circumstance. Okay. Good. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Um, thank you all very much for inviting me here this morning. Uh, it was it was certainly uh, impressive to see the, the variety of different uh, hats that we have in terms of people's roles, uh, and, and some that I wouldn't have looked at uh, uh, necessarily see here. I used to volunteer for the trustees at reservations a little while back, uh, doing trail care and stuff, so uh, good to have uh, a representative as one. So uh, what I thought we might do is just kind of run through a little bit of factual stuff. Um, you know, some folks have some familiarity with what motivational interviewing. I've got a, uh, also a video example we can take a bit of a look at, um, too. It is, uh, it is a conversation between a couple of folks who are uh, not exactly in the youth set. Uh, there are uh, good examples that we, uh, that we sometimes do use. Uh, one, actually, that I just thought of as we were going around the table, uh, that was a family planning conversation that actually would have been uh, a nice one to have, but we maybe can, uh, uh, I can always send you a link on that and we can come back to it at a different point. Um, so motivational interviewing, oh, and this is the bit where I usually tell folks where the bathrooms are and stuff, but I don't honestly know. <laughs> we're going to skip that bit. Um, is a particular method of communication, uh, of conversation, that was developed back in the early 1980s by uh, a few uh, specialists in substance abuse. And since that time, we found that uh, its use was not limited to that, uh, that sort of a, a sphere. And we've tried it out in a bunch of different, uh, well, broader spheres, let's say. Uh, probably the greatest area of advancement recently has been healthcare. And that's pretty broad. Uh, it's actually uh, a method that's been studied and tested pretty extensively in family planning conversations, for example, contraceptive use, uh, in violence prevention uh, programs, which I certainly heard mentioned quite a few times across the table. Um, and as I say, substance abuse, mental health, uh, health care, particularly long-term health care, uh, managing chronic uh, conditions like diabetes, for example, medication adherence. There's really not been a lot of areas where we have not seen effectiveness um, at this with this style of conversation. What we're basically trying to do uh, in this model is engage a person in conversation in a collaborative way. Uh, one of the ways that we, uh, we've kind of learned that we had traditionally done helping conversation is in a fairly confrontational and or doctor-patient sort of style. Substance abuse, of course, was famously con uh, confrontational for quite a long, long time. Still is in a lot of spheres. Uh, you, you still hear phrases like you have to break them down to build them up and that sort of thing. Uh, this method was kind of a reaction against that. Um, and similarly, uh, <coughs> similarly, another approach that we've often taken is that of the expert. Uh, we, we tend to uh, engage in conversation uh, such that I, as the expert, know uh, the information and you, as the patient or client or kid or whatever, uh, don't know the information, so I am going to imbue that to you, and then you're going to be all set. Uh, and what, of course, we know from uh, repeated experience is that that doesn't really work out terribly well by and large. There are some situations where that is what's needed and that is effective. Generally speaking, people tend to get a little on the reactive side when you tell them what they should be doing. Uh, and so this is a method that sidesteps that process, uh, hopefully in a way that's that's not something we should worry about, right? That's just sort of end of period sort of stuff. But yeah. But it happens a few times to start to think, maybe there's something I should be doing. Please all report to the parking lot in an orderly manner. <coughs> um, so collaborative, we're trying to be kind of on the same page with not take the expert role in a conversation and be sort of in partnership with the person so that they don't feel like they're being pressed, so that they don't feel like they're being told or preached to, etc. Goal-oriented means just that we're going to try to, in any given change conversation, establish what is the goal of the conversation. Uh, and that sometimes is role specific. Uh, if I am a tobacco cessation specialist, 
most people that are going to come and talk to me are going to be interested in one thing, or partially interested in one thing. Uh, and so I can, I can be pretty clear what the goal is. Sometimes there's a little more of a conversation that has to happen around that. Particular attention to the language of change refers to the fact that one of the things that we discovered with this method early on is there are certain things that predict whether a person is going to make a change or not. Uh, and by change, I generally am I'm trying to mean a positive change. Uh, someone may decide to uh, uh, do better in school, may decide to try to work on improving their relationship, uh, may decide to quit smoking, may decide to do something about their, their drinking. Those sorts of changes are the ones that, that typically I'd be referring to. But it's broader than that. Uh, really, any kind of change where there's a benefit to the person and where we would tend to advocate for someone to move in that direction is, is the kind of change that we would look to use this model in. By the by, any questions at all that come up in your mind during what I'm talking, please feel free to put those out there. Uh, sometimes I don't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and so I want to just kind of put on the table. So if you're, if you're not understanding, it's probably not you. Uh, so feel free to kind of put things out as you uh, as you need to. So that all said, that, that's what I mean by change. Language of change simply means that we've noticed that there are things a person says that are predictive. Uh, and that if we can see those things in the conversation and act to encourage those things in the conversation, we increase the likelihood that they will successfully change in a possible way. Similarly, there are things we can do that decrease the presence of change talk, if you will, in the conversation. Uh, and those behaviors on our part tend to move the person away from constructive change. Frustratingly, we often do those behaviors while trying to get them to change. Um, and that's kind of one of the, uh, one of the expert patient uh, problems that we come across in, uh, in change conversation generally. The methods designed to strengthen personal motivation for, I'm not going to read all the slides to you, just in case you're wondering. You'll, um, and commitment to a specific goal by exploring the person's reasons for change. What we're very interested in trying to touch in a change conversation with this method is why might this person be interested in change? Not why might we tell them that it would be a good idea for them, but what are their own internal reasons for change? Sometimes those are hard to get to. Sometimes the person doesn't acknowledge them. Sometimes the person doesn't recognize them. But the conversation is designed uh, or the style, I should say, is designed to try to get to those internal motivations for change and fan those sparks into a bit of a flame. Get the person excited and energized around the idea of a positive change for themselves and help them see it as being possible for themselves and therefore developing momentum towards it. Makes sense so far? Good, good, good. good. Within an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion, because we found judgment and uh, not compassion were probably counterproductive those kind of conversations. We generally conceive the method of being as being composed of three components. Uh, spirit, which is the general sense in which we interact with the person. What is the spirit from which we're operating? Uh, how are we conducting ourselves? Uh, what is the general sort of emotional vibe that, that the person we're talking to is getting from us? Uh, we're going to want that to be as welcoming, as warm, uh, as open, as accepting as we can. Skills are the individual behaviors that we employ in conversation. What specific things do we say? And finally, strategies are why do we say those things? Uh, how do we use those things in kind of a way that is likely to increase the person's motivation for change? Likely to help them feel more comfortable in the conversation, more open and able to explore the possibilities. Thoughts or questions so far? mentioned change talk a minute ago. Generally speaking, we categorize it in two sort of broad groups. Preparatory change talk is what you'll usually hear when someone is, is in the early stages of considering a possible change. Pre-contemplative was a word that was used earlier, contemplative. Uh, those are uh, words that are typically used in the stages of change model. Excuse me, developed by Prochaska and DiClemente in the early, oh, you're back here. <laughs> I should stop worrying. Um, <clears throat> and generally speaking, when someone's in those sorts of stages, a person is really not seriously thinking about it yet, you'll start to hear this kind of change talk. A person making statements that indicate a desire to change on some level, an ability to change, they think that they could change perhaps, reasons why they might change, and as, as things maybe progress to them feeling more uh, excited about change, 
on some level may be a need to change. That tends to progress into mobilizing change talk when a person starts to make committed statements, um, such as happened around the table here a few moments ago. The person will start talking about, I'm going to do something about this, and may start to articulate what some of those things are that they're going to do. Activation statements will usually sound like that. Uh, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to, uh, to approach my teacher after uh, class and ask about staying to get some extra help with this, because I, I just can't get calculus. Uh, and it's true, I never could get calculus. Uh, taking steps is the kind of the active phase of that, a person who's actually doing something, uh, small steps towards the change. And that's what we're trying to find in the conversation. If you think of it as kind of a, of a, of a search exercise, this is the goal that we're mining for in the conversation. We're trying to keep an ear out for these sorts of statements. We're trying to notice them, react to them, encourage them, uh, affirm them, and strengthen them if we can. As we do that, the likelihood of successful change increases. Make sense? <clears throat> so spirit, what we mean by motivational interviewing spirit, the first of the three sort of broad categories, is we're trying to operate in such a way that these descriptors are accurate for us, that we are acting uh, in a way that we are in partnership with the person, that we are being accepting of them on several several different ways of going into some detail about that we are being compassionate, and lastly, that we are trying to primarily evoke from them and not give to them or teach to them uh, what the reasons are why, why they might change or how they might go about a change if they did decide to, to get into a change pattern at this point in their lives. To start with, oops, that's right, I didn't get any, uh, I took out some of the slides that actually explain these a little more in detail because uh, time was a consideration. Typically, I take six days, by the way, to do this training. Um, so uh, compressing it into one hour was a bit of a, uh, a squeeze. <laughs> I like having that the luxury of six days. It, it, uh, it, it gives you a lot of breadth to be able to explain things in a bit more detail. And, and most importantly, what we learn kind of by hard lessons time and again is that uh, this is a method of conversation that can be learned, obviously. But it's not easy to learn. Uh, it takes actually a fair amount of practice, uh, and training does not do it in and of itself. Uh, so I could actually teach this model to you for six days, and you probably wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, and that's why when we're taking six days to do the training, um, very quickly we get through the didactic piece of it so that we can quickly move on to the practice piece of it. And so most of motivational interviewing training involves you actually being in conversation with somebody else and trying to use uh, the method. And that's uh, insanely hard for a while, and then gets less hard, and for usually some, most folks there's a clicking point at some point, and then they're kind of able to do it. Uh, and then improvement can kind of continue to happen from there. What we do find is when people can use this method, that the efficacy of their change conversations increases by about 20 to 40 percent. Uh, it does not increase to 100 uh, percent. We're not that good yet, uh, and I don't know that we ever will be. Uh, there's no 100 percent success rate. There are no magic bullets or magic wands or whatever magical thing you like to use uh, or at least dream about. Uh, but what we do know is that where before our effectiveness in change conversation was about here, it can go to about here if this is a method that we can get good at. Now there's variance in subgroups uh, as to how effective the method is. It seems to be relatively more effective in groups where people feel less uh, uh, autonomy or power in their daily lives. So as was brought up, uh, people who are mandated to be in a conversation, this method is comparatively more effective than pretty much everything else we've got. People who, who may view themselves as not having a lot of power in society. Young people, for example. Uh, folks from minority groups. Folks who are traditionally oppressed. Uh, you know, folks who uh, just have had a hard time with things. Uh, folks with serious uh, medical or psychiatric illnesses or substance abuse problems. Those are folks who seem to react more uh, prominently. Uh, though, even with folks that are not in those situations, it is an effective method, as far as we're able to tell so far. There's one group we have not been able to establish efficacy with, um, but only one, and uh, we're still trying to figure out what that's about. Any questions on the answer? Yeah. Oh, uh, the, the group that doesn't seem to work well, uh, pregnant smokers. 
I realize that's awfully specific. Uh, there are three studies so far on motivational interviewing uh, used with pregnant smokers. So far, all three studies have failed to show any result. That's very unusual for this method because it works with pretty much everything. Uh, I am not going to speculate on what that might be about because I've learned through our experience that I am not permitted to speculate mm -hmm. on anything involving pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any further questions that I can answer? Um, but so far, everything else we've tried and not uh, pretty effective, including dentistry. I'm pretty sure the SMILES program is not a dentistry program, um, <laughs> but I thought I'd try that anyways because there is a dental office in New Bedford someplace called SMILES. Um, I, I know I've seen it, and I can't remember uh, where exactly, but I thought, oh, it probably doesn't look like a dentist to me, but uh, we'll, we'll at least put it out there. Dentistry because of the flossing. We don't floss, uh, and they're trying to get us to floss. And we should floss. I mean, I, I, you got to give them that. Skills. Um, <coughs> here we'll go into a bit of detail because it seems to be helpful to folks to kind of get a sense of, well, what do you say in this kind of a conversation? Well, basically, there are four, there's different ways to conceptualize the skills and motivation. I mean, this is the simpler way uh, because, again, not a lot of time. Four things that we will we will very frequently do in conversation, one that we'll do less of in a general motivational interview conversation. That's why that one's red, kind of a warning sign, if you will. We'll come back around to that in a moment. Or two, questions are the first. Generally speaking, when we use questions in this method, and we try to use them less frequently, because uh, one of the things that we've, we've kind of uh, uh, come across is that most people who are in a helping relationship, whether that's educational, healthcare, or what have you, uh, tend to use questions as their primary mode of interaction uh, with the person that they're trying to help. And that makes a little bit of sense because uh, you, you feel like you need some information from the person. Uh, you want to try to draw them out into the conversation and questions are a way that we do that. And they're fairly effective in some regard. Uh, however, when we use them uh, to the exclusion of other, of other strategies, uh, what, we t what we tend to find is that uh, when my interactions with you primarily consist of me asking questions and you answering my questions, we pretty quickly get to the point where you stop talking unless I ask you a question. And then you answer the question and you wait for me to ask the next question. And if I'm interested in having you as energized and active in this process as possible so as to get you motivated, that is the opposite of what I want to have happen. So I want to try to prefer conversational uh, interventions that result in the person being more engaged and more active as opposed to more passive. And that's what questions tend to do. Questions tend to do. My apologies for the grammatical error. Hopefully none of you are the English teaching department type folks. Um, so in any given, uh, any given question we might use in a conversation, we generally can categorize either an open or a closed question. Those of you who have a human service background or psychology background, you may be familiar with those sorts of, of distinctions. Can somebody ask me a closed question, just to kind of give an example of that? How long have you been doing this? How long have I been doing this? Uh, about, I, I would say 15 minutes. Now, uh, just a guess on my part. Was more broadly, about seven or eight years. Um, but just this morning, about 15 minutes. What was the other one? Am I? Yes. I, I, I was. Um, I, I haven't looked down in the last few minutes, but I'm pretty sure I would have noticed if it had changed. Because uh, I would have had to been involved in that process, you'd think. So yes, both of those, short answer, closed questions. Open question, on the other hand. Anyone want to try one of those? What do you like about What do you like about What I like most? <coughs> uh, Bill Miller, who's the guy who developed the model, uh, has been very thoughtful and philosophical about, about why it seems to work. And one of the concepts that, that really has been populating a lot of his writing uh, in the last probably 10 years is a Greek word, uh, agape, which oddly enough, I noticed, is tattooed on Anne Marie's wrist. Uh, I did not plan that, uh, and I thought to myself, that's really weird. Miller's writing has been including that word rather a lot. Uh, the Greek language, Old Greek, Ancient Greek, has four words for love. Uh, and we only have one. We use one to kind of mean a whole bunch of different things, and they have four. Uh, and agape was the kind of love that is a love of fellowship between uh, people, 
uh, a love of community. Uh, that, that kind of feeling that you get when you're among people that you really value and whose interests you really have an interest in. Uh, you want people for whom you feel this to succeed because you uh, love them in that way. Uh, and that's a, that's a concept that, that Bill Miller has been writing a lot about as being kind of one of really the driving issues behind this. It's phrased as compassion you know, when we talk about the spirit of motivation interviewing, mostly because most people don't know what the word agape means, and compassion is much more accessible. And if you use the word love, it just has a whole lot of baggage in English that we're not trying to incorporate. We use romantic love. We use the same word for romantic love that we use for friendship love as we use for love of our kids or love of our job or whatever. We use that one word for all those different things, so the word is too mixed up. Um, whereas agape is actually the concept that fits, and compassion is kind of how they describe that. Thanks for the assist. Well, yeah. Did that just for you. <laughs> <laughs> now that is dedicated. Agape, one might say. <coughs> um, so that was an open question. Remember, we were doing open questions. That's how we kind of got around to that. Uh, because we want the person to be as active as possible, we, we tend to avoid a lot of closed questions with this method because that whole effect about shutting the person down with questions is really pronounced if you, if you use closed questions. If you just kind of uh, to, uh, fix it in your own heads, you have the experience where someone is filling out a questionnaire while they're talking to you, and this can happen in your doctor's office or the DMV or different places where you have to answer a bunch of yes, no questions, and the person's marking on a form. And you know the drill. You, Answer yes or no, and you wait for the next question, and you answer yes or no. There's an active person and a passive person in this conversation. And that's fine, you know, for what it is. You need to give information, they need to gather information, that process works perfectly well, we don't want to mess with that. Uh, sometimes you need specific bits of information, so closed questions are essential. But, if we're interested in getting a person engaged in a change process, closed questions are counterproductive. So we tend to use fewer of them, or we want to use fewer of them. We want to use more open questions and fewer questions altogether. Still good? Make it sense? I'm sure I'll lapse into inarticulateness at some point. Just wave at me when that happens. So we're going to look to have 70% of questions in any given motivational interviewing conversation be open, 30% be closed. Um, and then you're thinking, do you actually count the questions? Oh, yes, do we count the questions? There are an amazing number of things we try to count in these conversations when we assess them. Um, that's a whole other conversation we can have. Open questions might sound like this. These are fantastic open questions to use in this model. As you see, they're ones that tend to engage the person, ones that tend to get the person more active in the conversation. What ideas have you had about how you might change this? This can be anything, any positive change we want to uh, have the person consider. What's the downside of this for you, this being the present status quo, the way things are? Uh, the person gives us some change talk, we might say, well, why? Maybe the person said, well, I, I think it's important for you to do something about this. We could say, well, why? What, what is it that makes that important for you now? And the answers they give us to that will be more change talk, generally speaking. Tell me more about that. We actually consider this to be a question. I know grammatically speaking, this is not a question, it's a directive. Uh, but generally, we consider that to be a question in this method. Um, this is one of my favorites. Nice little envisioning sort of thing down here. If you did change this, how might your life be different in five years? For young people, I would go to like two years, uh, just because the foreshortening of, of, of future orientation is kind of a, a, a thing uh, in the young. Uh, it's long in my career in America, but. Uh, Probably still true for most young adults in adolescence. Or one year, or six months. Um, there's nothing magic about the, about the number five. There. There we go. Yeah, good. Affirmations. Um, we find that most populations uh, that we deal with, whether it's healthcare or education or what have you, um, folks don't have a whole lot. Uh, going on necessarily in the area of believing in their own capability. Uh, Self-esteem was an older word we used to use for that. I think it's a little played at this point. Uh, and the way that we approach that have sometimes been, I think, open to challenge. Uh, but in a conversation with someone where they're feeling accepted by us, where, where they're in investing the relationship with some importance, uh, where they're seeing us as someone who can be helpful to them, 
This can be extremely powerful, using affirmation to notice their strengths, their capacities, their past successes perhaps, their values, things that are important to them. Uh, something that was said uh, just a bit earlier about, uh, about uh, developing a list of positive adjectives for some young people. Uh, that can be very, very powerful. Uh, and I probably don't have to tell you that. You probably uh, see this on a daily basis more than I do, most of you. Uh, we want to be careful to include this sort of thing in the conversation by maintaining a lookout for it. What in the conversation kind of makes us see that's really a strength of this person. And can I call that out? Can I mention that uh, as, I'm, as I'm talking to the person in the conversation? We find, go back a couple here. These first two bits of change talk, desire and ability, uh, they seem to be both necessary for there to be a reasonable expectation of successful change. And what I mean by that is that uh, for any, any given change, the person has to both desire the change, they want to do this, and they have to believe that they can do it. If either of those are absent, the person's unlikely to change. That's probably kind of self-evident. Uh, person who thinks they can change but doesn't want to, not going to change. Person who wants to change but doesn't think they can, not likely to change. Person who neither wants to nor thinks they can is probably not going to change at all. Uh, but where both of those are present, then we've got that glimmer of hope. This person can do something about it, they think that they can do it, and they want to do it. And both of those conditions have to be in place. And I'll fast forwarding again to where we were here. This skill in the conversation speaks to that second piece. Does this person think that maybe they're not able to make a change? Affirmation can help with that. If they're hearing us point out positive things that we're getting from the conversation, not just stuff we're kind of making up, because we have to have something positive to say, but stuff that we can tie to things that they've said or done gives it some weight, gives it some reality for the person. That helps to build up their sense of self-efficacy, see themselves as a, as a potentially, at least, a capable change agent. And when that's the case, then we're addressing one of those key elements. The ability piece is hopefully kind of coming into place. And if we've got that solid, then the desire piece is the only other bit. If that's there, then we're moving. We're, we're able to kind of move this thing into, into, a, into an active change process. Does that make sense? See how that kind of gels together? There? Reflective listening uh, is the skill that we will generally spend the most time on if we're actually doing motivational interviewing training. Uh, and <clears throat> it is the most difficult one to get good at, uh, particularly complex reflection, which we'll come around to in a bit. Uh, it is well, among other things, it's a method of us kind of checking in and making sure that the person gets that we're listening to what they're saying by being able to, to give them back something uh, in some sort of, a, of, a, of an abridged, sort of uh, summarized way. Uh, basically, what we're looking to do is make a guess about the meaning of what they've said. And that's easy to do if we stay close to what the words that they used. And maybe just change a couple of things here and there, uh, use synonyms. Uh, that's safe to do. Uh, we can get a little riskier with it, and we generally want to get a little riskier with it by doing more with what the person says, expanding the meaning of it in some sense, uh, changing the intensity of it, counterpointing it against something else. Those are things that we're going to look to do in the conversation to develop uh, the conversation, to make things bigger, uh, to try to uh, create movement in the conversation. As I said, simple reflections. Um, are going to stay close to the content. They don't create as much movement towards change, but they do keep the conversation moving. Complex reflections, which are kind of the gold standard of reflection, are going to look to change the content by adding or altering emphasis. Uh, and they tend to create <coughs> excuse me, more movement towards change. So generally speaking, we're going to want to include a lot of those in the conversation. And they include things like this. So... Um, could I have somebody volunteer uh, to just have a brief kind of back and forth conversation in which we'll kind of demonstrate how some of these look in conversation? Maybe, um, this being kind of early in the new year, you've all got New Year's resolutions perhaps that have already fallen by the wayside because it's February now. January usually people usually keep it going. Uh, but for a lot of folks, uh, increasing exercise is something that we look to do in January. It's one of the gym's biggest months for new memberships that never show up. Um, 
Is that an area that anyone's willing to chat a bit about? The desire to maybe increase exercise level? Or are you all there already? Yes? Okay. Well, mine is more about switching gyms. Switching gyms? I've been commuting yeah. to a gym for almost two years in Newport, from East Greenwich, Rhode Island. And bit I of a ride. to switch gyms, but there's a lot of camaraderie at my gym where I am now, I'm a trainer, so I just did this in a motivational interview exercise I just had at my agency. But so, so I'm willing to do that one if you want. That, let's, let's do that. So, so if I have your right, you've got an established relationship with this gym, yep. and, and you like it there, and you like the relationships that you have there. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, it's been very difficult to get there because of the distance involved, and you feel like you'd get more effectiveness out of the gym membership if you had something more accessible to you. Yeah, and I'm probably paying way more in Newport than <laughs> down the road where I am now, so. The double-sided reflection just points up the ambivalence. She's between two different uh, uh, aspects of the decision, she could go one way or the other way. She could stay where she is or she could leave. And all the double sided reflection does is say, so here you are, here's the dilemma. The more time a person spends in that dilemma point, the more typically uncomfortable the dilemma becomes and the, the increased resolution to resolve it is something that hopefully creates a movement in the situation by itself. So for you, I'm sorry, your first name? Allison. Allison. Thank you, Allison. Um, so for you, it's very frustrating not to get the benefit that you'd like to get out of the gym membership. Um, yeah, I guess that's true. Because I probably would go more often if I was still living in Newport. So I really only go to specific classes that I, spinning class and like an abs core class. So, but if I was closer, I probably would go more often during the week. Yeah, and you'd like that. That would be something that would be more of a benefit to you. Right. Continue with the paragraph, taking what she says. What's the next thing that is the logical, uh, the logical next sentence? And she would like that. Uh, that would be more of a benefit for her. Uh, was where I thought that that, um, that that paragraph might have been going. She confirmed that. Um, so when I use frustrated, you kind of hemmed on that. So I'm thinking that frustrated is actually maybe too strong a word. It's just that you, you like the way things are, but it's just kind of nagging thought that maybe it could be better, maybe you could be doing more with this. Yeah, I don't really feel frustrated. Um, let's see. I don't really know what the feeling word would be, but um, it do, for me, it just does, it doesn't make sense. Like, I'm spending a lot of time traveling and I'm spending more money. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think it's more just about my own. Um, anxiety and ambivalence about joining a new gym. Like, I'm very comfortable where I am now. I'm used to the, the people that are there. It's small. There's more older people than, you know, than joining like a huge gold gym where I am. The idea of, of going to a new place is frankly kind of terrifying to you. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes overshooting is right. Um, sometimes you, you inflate the emotions. It's kind of anxious about, she used the word anxiety. Uh, about the idea of going to a new gym, I turned anxiety into terrifying. And she was like, yeah, no, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that is it. Uh, and that's what you're sometimes, sometimes trying to test with an overshooting reflection is the person saying this, is it really up here? Because uh, sometimes it really is up there. Now, sometimes the reverse is the case. Sometimes they're, they're down here, and <clears throat> I'm interested in seeing, I think they're down here. So I inflate up to here, and the person goes, no, 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 it's really more down here. Uh, which is kind of what we had earlier with frustrated. I uh, ended up undershooting uh, after noticing her reaction to my use of the word frustrated as an emotional part. She was like, mm -hmm. but not frustrated exactly. So can I fine tune that to get a word that better resonates with her, that better expresses for her and for me where she's really at that? Thoughts or questions around that? Do have any gym ideas for us? <laughs> See that works in conversation, mm -hmm. or it can work in conversation. Anyways, mm -hmm. twenty to forty percent. Uh, any other questions on reflection? This is good. <coughs> uh, every once in a while, someone likes doing the 
question and reflection reflect because most use twice as many reflections as questions in motivation learning. That's one of the one of the benchmarks. One of the actually the one that we know the most about is that one. It seems like when we study motivational interviewing as a method, research studies will take a look at it. If that if that two to one ratio is there, the motivation interviewing effect on conversation is present. If that's not there, the effect tends to dissipate. Down around one to one reflection to questions, you see a little bit of it. Below that, you don't see the effect at all. So it seems like the uh, the central strength of the method is the ability to make a conversation primarily reflective in nature. So that most of what we're doing in the conversation is reflecting and expanding what the person has said, not asking them questions, but rather using their own content to drive the conversation. People seem to find that generally very empowering. It has a positive effect by itself on the person. Uh, we find that over time, a person who becomes accustomed to this method of interaction as a recipient tends to develop more empathic self-talk, which is kind of an interesting effect that we weren't looking for and kind of happened across it before. So that the way they talk to themselves tends to become more empathic uh, and more and more empowering. Uh, and that, that, of course, can uh, breed dividends over the long haul. Summaries, uh, more or less, are reflections, uh, but we just tack a bunch of them together to cover more ground. We'll use this often in conversation to kind of wrap things together. So if we uh, wanted to summarize our conversation, <coughs> excuse me, with Allison, we might say, so if I have you right, uh, you've got a bit of a dilemma. Uh, there's a part of you that likes the gym that you're at and likes the relationships that you have there. It would be difficult in some senses to leave that. And there's a part of you that's, that's seeing the potential of, of trying something closer to home. That's scary on some level, but you see that there may be better benefits there. You may get more bang for your buck uh, from that sort of an investment over the long term than from what you've been doing at this point. It would be a way of kind of drawing together the different reflections and the different aspects of what else been said in that conversation. Some are quite useful because they kind of help to, to keep the conversation on track. They're a way that we can kind of glump things together, glump, not a word, um, and, and then kind of move on to using like a what else question or a, we're just asking directly about a different aspect of the problem or the, or the perspective change. So those are the basic skills that we would generally tend to use. Um, now, additionally, we don't want to, give the misimpression that because we're trying to be in partnership and because we're not trying to assume the expert role explicitly, that all of the experience and expertise that we bring to a conversation is not valid or not wanted in the conversation. Absolutely, we want that to be in there. Uh, what we want to do is be very careful and advised about how we contribute that because we don't want to mess up the partnership aspect. We don't want to make this conversation less collaborative. We want to continue to have that there uh, but we also want to be able to bring in things that we might know. So take a family planning conversation, for example, if <coughs> a young lady comes in and has uh, questions, we want to answer those questions. We certainly want to hear where she's coming from. We want to be able to help her to expand on what it is that she wants to, to get out of uh, the situation, where she wants to go in her life. Uh, but she probably also wants information. Uh, we want to be able to contribute that. Uh, we generally, in this method, are going to try to draw it from the person first by asking questions like, so what do you already know about this? What aspects of this are you already familiar with? And let them tell us uh, what, that, what those aspects are. We've all had the experience where you go in looking for some information on something and the person starts from square one. And you're already at square seven. Uh, you want to get to like square 13. Uh, and so a lot of the stuff that they're telling you is stuff you already know. Uh, and then they tell you something wrong, you're like, well, wait a second. <laughs> and you start to question their expertise. Uh, but that's a side thing. Uh, you don't want to necessarily start from square one. You want to see what the person has already in their repertoire, what research have they already done, especially nowadays with the interwebs. Uh, everyone's kind of got some information somewhere. That also gives you the opportunity to correct misinformation uh, when a person brings up things that they know. And you're like, ooh, you know, that, that's a bit that you know, is, is commonly thought but not correct. You can then circle around to that and say, oh, and I heard you say this, and I just wanted to give you some clarifying information about that, if that's okay. Uh, people are always open to that 
and so that's a way that we do that. Um, we will, if we're going to offer information or advice, we're going to have the person ask for it, or we're going to ask them for permission to contribute it. We want the conversation to feel like a consultation between two professionals uh, as much as possible, like we're talking to a colleague. Uh, it should have that, that sort of a, a, of a flair to it. Um, and not so much I'm talking to a child or I'm talking, I'm a doctor to a patient, uh, less that. We want to defer to the person about whether our advice or information is applicable. They know their situation much better than we do. Um, so things that we might think would be a great solution to their problem, they might not see as being realistic for themselves. And if they don't see that as being realistic for themselves, it's really probably not going to work. Uh, so we probably ought to just let it go. Because uh, because it's very tempting to kind of fall into the trap of arguing, well, it would work if you give it a try. Uh, well, now we're setting up a bit of a power struggle here. The person's almost wanting it not to work so they can prove us wrong. Uh, and that's not a, a situation that's helpful for us to begin. So we want to be very deferential to the person's judgment around whether they think solution X might be a good fit for them. And we want to be careful to reinforce their freedom of choice. The more the person feels that they have autonomy in a situation, the more likely they are to move in a positive direction. It is when that autonomy is threatened that a person tends to dig their heels in. When, we, when they feel like we're pushing them, or their parents are pushing them, or someone is pushing them, that's when you see that, the resistance, most prominent, right? Uh, where we can defuse that and help them to see the choices as being available to themselves. People fairly reliably want to move in good directions for themselves, directions that are consistent with their interests. Um, you can't always rely on that, but it's broadly true. Any thoughts or questions on that problem? Well, when dealing with children, sometimes kids' perceptions are really uh, skewed, or yep. you know, really off base. Yeah. Where do you go with that? Well, <coughs> there, there's a couple of ways. Uh, sometimes reflection by itself uh, is a bit of a curative for that. When we're able to kind of bounce some things back to them, it sounds different coming from us, and they think, that's probably not what I meant, and they want to clarify, and, and then you end up moving closer to a more realistic view. That sometimes is effective, but not always. Uh, failing that, informing and advising is a method that we might use. Uh, I heard you just say this about that, uh, and a lot of people do think that that's the case. There's some information about that I can give to you if you'd be willing to hear it that I think you might find to be helpful. And usually, the kid's going to say, well, what is it? You know, and because you've piqued curiosity at that point, and they're at least willing to hear. Uh, whereas if we kind of went into instruction mode, there's a risk of shutting that down a bit because there's defensiveness around. Once they've asked, well, what is it? Then there's, there's more of an openness already to at least hearing what you have to say. Uh, and that gives you a better shot. Now, are we are we going to be always able to kind of get around misinformation that's out there? No. Um, are we going to have kids that are going to cling to a certain level of, unreal, of unrealism? Absolutely. And then that's kind of what we're dealing with. Uh, but it can be helpful with that, it seems. Does that make sense? Um, strategies. So, given the spirit and skills, there's different approaches that we'll take in conversation. One of them, looking ahead, looking forward, uh, is, is uh, quite similar to that question that I pointed out to you a few slides back. If you, if you look ahead in your life a few years, uh, let's say you did make this change, how do you think your life would be different? And letting a person react to that is what we would call an evocation strategy. Uh, helps a person to think about reasons for change, uh, compelling things about their future that might be true if they did X, and if, if X is successful. Asking evocative questions, just stuff as simple as, well, what are some reasons why this might be a good idea for you? How do you see it? Uh, what are some reasons why you might not want to make this change? Is sometimes useful early in the process. Usually you want to follow that with them, and what are some reasons why you might want to? The running head start is a technique that does exactly that. Um, we use this in situations where the person does not seem interested in change at all, uh, particularly useful in, uh, in early stage uh, substance use. 
you, you, you have a teenager you're talking to who's using cannabis, uh, and the parents are all up in arms about it, and he's not really seeing this as an issue. You know, this never happens. Um, everyone's making a big deal out of nothing. All my friends do it. They're, it's not that big a deal. People should just get off my back. Well, if we engage this kid in argument, we're probably just going to wind up with him strengthening his own position out of rebelliousness. Because uh, I realize that some teenagers can sometimes become rebellious. I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, so why don't we avoid that dynamic? The running head start would have us then say to the kid, what do you like about it? What does it do for you? What do you think are the positives for it? And let the kid talk about that and reflect those positives because they're real for him. And so he'll talk and he'll talk and we'll reflect and we'll reflect and then we'll summarize at the end and we'll say something like so. You like the way that it makes you feel. Sometimes you get anxious about things, and it seems to help you calm down. You like the fact that it's a way to socialize with your friends. Uh, you like the kind of sense of camaraderie that you guys have, and it feels kind of good to be a little bit of a bad boy uh, and do this thing. And you see it as being not that big a deal, and I'm not as dangerous as something like alcohol, really. Uh, so for you, it's a way to kind of be a little bit of a bad boy, but still not really do anything that's going to hurt anybody. The kid's likely to endorse that, presuming that stuff that's pretty close to what he was saying. And since we've heard him out and validated, if you will, his perspective, we then get to say, where does it sometimes get in your way? Where does it sometimes cause problems for you? And we're more likely to get a straight answer on that stuff than if we started with that question. You start with, where does marijuana cause problems for you? You're going to get one answer. Doesn't it? Nothing. You know? uh, but when the kid is feeling like, you know, this person's listening to me, and willing to hear what I say, then you're more likely, not certain, but more likely to get a response that's going to be valuable. You're more likely to get some change talk. Make sense? Yeah, that yeah. Points and confidence rulers, if we had a little more time, because I'm very aware that it's 1027 now, um, so I wanted to wrap up. But basically, that's a, a set of scaling questions we use to gauge a person's uh, Readiness for change by, by testing where they're at on the importance of a change and confidence that they can make a change successfully. It kind of goes back to the desire and ability thing that we talked about a little bit ago. And by way, I mean I. Um, <coughs> and, and gives the person a, a visual on that. We can do that sort of in a, in a written kind of way or abstractly if you prefer to. Uh, very effective tool, very helpful tool to use, and one that can kind of uh, be referred back to in, in uh, subsequent conversations. I uh, do want to allow a couple minutes for, the, for any questions if people have them. Uh, if you did want to do more with this, there are numerous opportunities uh, to, to do training in this model. There's an agency in Portland, Maine, that does a lot of this. But locally, there's a lot of availability. I actually just did a one-day training last week in Marlboro uh, for ad care and educational services to do a lot of substance abuse stuff. Uh, but there's opportunities certainly around and about that we can plug you into it. So any thoughts, questions, or? I get all of this, and then both examples that you gave, how do you get to, so what are you going to do? Like, I get, like, what you just said about all the, you know, this whole conversation where, you know, so where does it get in your way? Okay, now you've got all that out on the table. Yeah. Now, like, we want to change, <laughs> right? <laughs> so what's that, what's that, that next, deal there? what's that next, like, where do you, uh, do you ask a question? Like, so what are you going to, like, how, how do you think you can... So I think it goes to his important and confidence ruler. That's one, yeah, so, the strategies okay. are the ones that we use to really move the conversation around. And I would usually spend two days on this slide so uh, and expand all these out into a lot more detail. That's really how you create the movement in the conversation. Basically, to use Allison as an example, uh, presuming that there was a real uh, value for change here, if she stays at the gym she's at, there's probably benefit to that. If she moves to a different gym, there's probably benefit to that. Um, a better example would be if she was going to a gym now and wanted to go to one, great. We would we would try to we would have that as our change goal, uh, and I would be working in the conversation to really help her build up her own motivation for change, to reinforce the change talk so it increases in both salience and frequency. And at a certain point, I'm going to think she's really sounding like she's ready, and then I'm going to ask, so what do you want to do about this? And I'm going to get her ideas to resolve the problem. Um, I'm going to prefer her ideas, because the ones that she comes up with, she's more likely to follow through on. 
Uh, so it's, the more I can use those, the better. If she misses stuff that I think might be helpful, I'm going to do that whole ask permission to contribute and, and, and roll, roll those in there too, summarize those together with her ideas, and then draw her into, so what's the, you know, what's the plan? Uh, help her to construct a plan to do these things, and then we're off to the races. Uh, but we would take a lot longer. What is coming alongside? Oh, coming alongside. Uh, yeah, that's one of the evocation strategies. It is the only one of them that's actually a reflection and not a question. Um, so let's take our, our class smoking teenager uh, as a good example. Uh, this kid is sitting in front of me and he's saying all the things that are great about marijuana and why it's, it's not a big deal and why people just need to get off this case. If I was going to use the coming alongside intervention uh, with him. What I would say is probably something like, so really there's no reason why you would ever want to do anything about your marijuana. Now you see there's a risk there because uh, there's there's a substantial possibility that that kid might say, yeah, uh, <laughs> and, and then where are you at? Where you're using that particular intervention is where you, you hear the kid giving you a lot of sustained talk of uh, this is why it's not a big deal. But you think that there's more to the story underneath there. So doing something big like that can have the effect of him going, you know, I, I'm not saying I want to be one of those 40-year-olds in my parents' basement, you know, just living there because I never got a job or anything. At some point, I'll need to kind of, you know, tone, tone it down a bit. But right now, it's not that big a deal. Well, now I've got change talk. The kid's acknowledging the need for change at some future point. And then it's a matter of negotiation. Where is that point? And what then kind of drives that that, that cut down? Um, it's well, one that is less commonly used because of the risk of endorsement. Yeah. And so if you did say, yeah, you're right. Where would you go then? I, I would say, please don't tell your mother that we have this. Because he's going to do something you can do about it. Yeah. Um, I just validate it. <coughs> uh, if, if a kid does endorse that, there's actually the video example I was going to use has an example of that there where the person endorses it and says, yeah, actually. Uh, and then there you are, and so you just back up and you try something else. Um, you know, no harm, no foul. It didn't work, but there doesn't seem to be really a whole lot of downside to it, unless the kid's going to go tell his parents that the counselor just said that I really should never stop smoking pot. So uh, if you did the looking forward instead of looking forward and anticipating positive change, could you do the looking forward? So what if we go that route? What if we continue to use let's look forward? Where do you see yourself? In yeah. What we call that one. Uh, is querying extremes. Extreme. Querying extremes. What is the worst case scenario? Uh, if this goes the way it's going, where do you see this headed? Yep. Now the risk with that kid, obviously, is he's not going to give you anything dire. Because uh, this kid is at least expressing that he does not see an issue with his use. Um, that's more useful where you have a kid who's clearly ambivalent. And so then you can kind of draw that out and say, well, you know, where do you see this headed? Uh, and that kid's more likely to give you some stuff that they're worried about. With this kid, you probably want to use something like the running head start because you're not getting any change talk from him at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have nothing to lose by just drawing out the sustained talk. Yeah. Um, just let him go with that, reflect it as long as you, you, you want, and then pivot and say, where's the problem for us? So then you're likely to get some change talk. Uh, it won't be very strong, but it'll be something, and you can build on something or build on nothing. Anything else for me? This keeps rolling through my mind. How would you? This, I mean, a lot of this seems so Rogerian. Oh yeah. You know, so but but the differences would be what that this is more sort of focused Directed. in terms of yeah. change. It's uh, Rogerian, uh, and, and now we're going to get into the heady uh, mm -hmm. psychology uh, aspect of it. But yeah, Carl Rogers is really the the originator of the right. basis of the method, uh, and one of the uh, drawbacks. It's not true, but. One of the things people criticized uh, Rogers for is that his method of, of conversation, while it was very warm and, and accepting and helpful to a lot of folks, you didn't necessarily go anywhere with it because it was all about just following where the person was. And so people yeah. were just kind of talking in circles. Yeah. So Miller basically yeah. asked the question, yeah. can we do that? Can we keep what is good exactly. about that, exactly. but channel this so that yeah. it becomes uh, productive, right. uh, or at least more reliably productive than it was? And that's where that's where motivation and that came from. It's very much of the Rogerian school, right. um, but is a is a more well, focused method of that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. Thank you.
information to anybody who would like it, and I'll send a reminder email for those videos and pass those on as well. Without an email for our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.